That's a five second rule. It's all right. <laughs> nice. Why? Because I like you. <laughs> Why? Because I like you. Exactly. That's right. Yeah. I love it. My motto. I love it. He's a great guy. Yeah. I want to grow up to be Fred Rogers. Um, it, you oh, have. That's a good aspiration. I, I want- <laughs> that's a good aspiration. Give it, give it another 40 or 50 years. Uh, yeah, I've, I've got time. <laughs> you know, what do you want to be when you grow up? I- <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm bum, bum. <laughs> Um, oh yeah, I was gonna say. Uh, it, do you have a, a tasty uh, beverage to enjoy during the uh, during the interview oh, during the video? Um, at the no, beginning of I okay, at the beginning of every episode, we always uh, uh, pop open. It, it used to be real beer, but we've since uh, uh, gone dry, so we just do ginger beer <laughs> now. But we still like Why the uh, dry. Did some, does somebody have a problem? No, nobody had a problem. It, it was fine. Onion? We just no. found it was easier to get through the episode not drunk. <laughs> uh, in the begin in the beginning, we drank because uh, more. I was very nervous doing the recording, but we've been doing this for a good number of years now, and we've gotten used to that. And then uh, a little while ago, we had to start recording in a location in a school. Oh, so then yeah. we had we had to make the choice of well we can't have beer there so we went non alcoholic yeah so I don't but we kept to the name job. so we so we kept to the name uh, because we drink ginger beer mm-hmm. huh. oh oh that's right it's beer with Buffy beer with um, Buffy yep when you went dry or as it were became teetotalers <laughs> for the time of the show uh, did you notice any change in the show or in your behavior on the show. I noticed it's a lot easier to edit. <laughs> oh, it is. Yeah. Um, and, yeah, it's, I, and I think it's easier to be funny, um, hepped up on caffeine than it is while drunk. Like maybe things are funnier to you while you're drunk, yeah, but it yeah. doesn't necessarily I, make I it funnier to listen to. And, and drunks think they're the funniest people in yeah. the world. And I've been drunk do. myself for about two <laughs> decades. Um, but uh, yeah, but they're really the stupidest people around. <laughs> So it was a, a wise decision. Thank you. Glad you approve. Is this for me? I must be ready. I need my strength. strength. Give, 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 give me more. Night, I shall give, walk give, in give, here. Give, 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 give. Hold on. You've got something here. Uh, oh. Hello. Welcome to Beer with Buffy, everybody. I'm Josh. I'm, I'm Rex. Mark. Oh, I'm Mark. <laughs> and uh, today we have oh. an extra special guest for you. That's all right. Um, you probably recognize him from movies like Animal House, TV shows like Seinfeld. But we are all here because uh, we all know him best from our favorite TV show ever. Buffy the Vampire Slayer as everyone's favorite ancient one, the master, Mark thank Metcalf. You, thank, you. thank you. Thank you thank so you. much for being here today. I hear yeah, thank you very, very much. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, let's let's just get this started. I got a handful of uh, a list of questions. I know Rex has a few questions for you. Um, yes, we, yes, we, yes. Main, we mainly really just want to hear about the uh, all the fun times you had on sets um, <laughs> and some okay. anything else you can think we'll of. Done, my... We'll be done quickly. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> or, or the not fun times. Those <laughs> drama is well, good there, too. There was a lot. There was a lot of it that was arduous because of five hours of getting makeup on. Right. And then yeah, that, that was actually going to be one of my first questions: is is the makeup yeah. process? Yeah, yeah. It, it took at the beginning of the season. It took five hours because primarily they had already taken a death mask or a life mask. I think they call it, and uh, had created the foam that covered my face, my neck, my ears, and the skull. And they applied that beginning of the season, they applied it. They didn't know quite what they wanted, what colors they wanted it to be and how. So they Ah. put it on and then paint it, and that took a long time. But it was great for me because it was very collaborative. They would ask my opinion, and I'd say a little here. And I'm colorblind, but they listened to me. And they they were really it was a wonderfully collaborative process. And it but you can and you can notice as the season goes on, what she refers to as my punch bowl mouth 
in the, I think the last episode, or second to last episode. Yeah. Somewhere in there. Prophecy Girl. Uh, I just looked that up at, um, where she says, you've got fruit punch mouth. That's specifically <laughs> something I wanted to ask about. Um, yeah. Yeah, as, as long as we're there, um, was was that an inside joke on set throughout the, the season? Or um, how did that come about? That line. I don't. I think it wasn't throughout the season because, as I was saying, they sort of painted it. If you watch the season from one, just binge watch it straight through, you uh-huh. can kind of see that mouth evolve, where to where it was the like I'd been sucking on a on a neck, a bloody neck for right. most of right. for eight hundred years. <laughs> yeah. um, so it wasn't. It wasn't a. It wasn't a joke that went on all season. I think. I think that was probably the first time I heard it. They may have been whispering behind my back. I don't know. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't pay any attention to those people. Um, but uh, and I don't know if she brought it up or Josh probably noticed it happening, and it was a discussion because he was part of the collaborative process of what it would look like to when what they wanted it right. to look like as they painted it. By the end of the season, it was only taking them three and a half hours to apply the makeup because they were able to paint it beforehand and then apply it and then finish touching it up. But it was fun to wear. I mean, it was, it was, it was arduous and it, but it was also fun. It, it was hot, Southern California, Santa Monica. Oh yeah. And right. I sweat a lot. And the only way to get the sweat out, it would pool right at the end of my nose. Oh Lord. <laughs> they, would, they would have to take a pin and prick the end of the nose and then, milk my nose oh, oh gross <laughs> and, and then and then catch up the hole yeah, it was, it was no way the, yeah. oh man well i'm glad they that, found a more efficient use of your time though at least by painting it beforehand <laughs> like i i had to had do a little bit of special makeup work just once um all they were doing was taking a mold of my face so they could make a fake severed head um for, uh, a, pl- for a play that i was in because my character yeah. gets beheaded and um, and just having to be under that mold for I think it was half an hour or something, I just was just gripping the chair the whole time, like let this be over. <laughs> but they also had to like cover my my eyes and my nose, and they were supposed to have put straws well, up, nose, up my probably. nose before they put the 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 goop on my face, but they didn't. And then oh, so really? they, so they just had to like scoop out my nostrils real quick <laughs> before I suffocated. <laughs> Uh, real professional. Oh, it was great. And inevitably, some of that goop went up further in rather than out, and is up there in your brain oh, yeah. to this day. Oh, very yeah. probably. Oh. It's, it's why I'm the <laughs> colorful man I am today. <laughs> I think you've got a lawsuit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I seriously doubt that. Um, uh, anyway, uh, did you did you find that the the makeup helped at all with with the role? Oh yeah, it 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 it, it was the role. <laughs> Often the right. makeup and the costume is is the character for me. Um, but no, it helped a lot. Uh, uh, the the process of putting it on helped a lot too because you can't do anything. I thought when I first realized it would be doing to take a long time to put this makeup on. I thought I'd learn Italian. I'd just put headsets on, but you can't put headsets on. You can't move your mouth except to talk when they ask you a question or when you have some comment that you want to make. <laughs> so it became a real, had to become a real meditation. Yeah. And it, it forced me to sort of work in, go inside myself and meditate and use some of the research that I'd done. I had them play these old, not Gregorian chants, but even older than Gregorian chants that sounded like they were recorded in a cave deep underground they played that oh, nice. instead of playing Mozart, which would have been too fun. Uh, <laughs> right. to sort of, right. Just to yeah. sort of bring that that world of the vampire, and again, the world of the vampire. What do we know of it except what we imagine it to be? Mm-hmm. Right. Just early on, the great thing about writing about vampires is that there are no rules. You can make up the rules. Mm-hmm. There are certain things like out after you got you got to can't you have to be back in your coffin during the day Mm -hmm. but we didn't do that i mean but anyway uh yeah a lot of people get stuck in the lore of other vampire shows as well i've noticed with the like what we do in the shadows are you familiar with that show 
No, I don't okay. watch too much TV. That, that's okay. It's it's a newer show about uh, vampires, and a lot of times I find myself watching and being like, "Well, they can't do that. That's not how vampires work." I'm like, eh, yeah. "Well, that's no. They can work exactly however they want them to work. It's however fiction. they want them to yeah. work. They can yeah. have they can look like Abercrombie and Fitch models with uh, all glitter all over them, like they do in that <laughs> Twilight thing. Twilight, or yeah. Can, uh, I mean, I, when. When I first was cast, John, they showed me the sketches for what the master should look like. And he, he had kind of long, black, stringy hair, a little bit like Keith Richards, maybe, when he was young and still alive. Um, and and I, I suggested that I Nosferatu had been one of a good a favorite yeah. film of mine even before I got this part. But I went back and watched it again, the, the Murnau version of it and then also the the uh i can't remember who directed but willem dafoe played shank and uh what's his name oh i i love that movie it's a really wonderful film dafoe's yeah. great and i can blanking on the on the well malkovich plays uh, mm. uh Mal. and the relationship and the fact that shank went kind of in that movie anyway went kind of crazy and began to think he was the vampire but i'd seen that so i said why why don't we bring along even though we don't have to obey any of the vampire rules, really, we w- we still want to exist. We want the audience who has seen this vampire world before to trust us. So why don't we mm-hmm. hearken back to and bring forward some of the history of vampires and the Nosferatu character, I think, is the first time a vampire ever appeared on screen. It, so, yeah, okay. then... You're, That's you're why right the, on that. The makeup it, it, it looks is, like is. a little bit remi- is, is reminiscent of, of uh, Shank and and, uh, and Nosferatu. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that's one Great. of the things I love about the character design of the master is it, it invokes that kind of old school legend and the yeah. old school design. And uh, the Nosferatu is the classic idea of a vampire i think and i yeah. you know I mean, he, to even, me even when oldman does it in the uh, in the coppola uh dracula movie he he refers to it a little bit you 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 really kind of have to if you want to be honest and once you've done it once you've set it up as a visual in the audience's mind then they bring all that everything they've known about vampires forward as yeah. opposed to exactly what you were saying about uh, what we do in the shadows, it's it's okay to ignore all those rules, but you can't really ignore them because the audience right. will, say, will not trust you anymore, right? Because they've if they've seen the other stuff, so or at the very better- least, they need to be consistent among the rules that that you've set for yourselves, anyway. And that's like just right. one of the rules of you know fiction in general. And it's still yeah. there's still rules. They're not normal rules but um if you step right. outside of that then you start to just you know what are you doing yeah <laughs> once you've established a drug trip the film? Of your universe you have to have to have to live with it exactly uh-huh yeah continuity you need you need interior continuity there it is right. one right. word good job <laughs> thanks rex um yeah I, were there any other techniques that you used to get into the character I, it, it couldn't have just all been i mean maybe it could have i don't know um but to get into character <laughs> um did you uh, study any of those classical forms of uh acting uh back in the well, day yeah i mean overacting comes natural to me <laughs> and uh to a certain extent i think that's inherent in what josh was writing and what he intended and uh there's a one once or twice at least that I'm I'm sort of summoning up um what's her name? Sylvia Sidney from Sunset Boulevard. The whole the whole thing with the hand and calling her forth mm. with my hand. Yeah. Yeah. She does stuff like that. And there's a there's a kind of a, a wonderful grandiosity in that. And there's something in silent movies of the in the gestural language of silent movies that I think I, I that I worked on instilling not not precisely but it, it uh it's such a it's such a wonder, wonderful world to be in this vampire world and then wearing a mask gives you a kind of a liberty that you don't have and we studied mask in acting school and all that stuff and it and it's true that it does give you 
a liberty. It frees you up somehow when you're behind a mask, when it isn't just your face that the right. camera's seeing. The, the mask allows you to re- more easily become someone else. Uh, so, I, so I tried to bring, and also this living in a cave under in a church buried under the ground, it's just such a grand notion of 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 how to of, of of an environment that it made me think of silent movies and some of that the gestural things in silent movies and I and Joss I think uh, intended that to a certain degree and then also there's a collaboration once an actor is cast and um, the writer hasn't written everything or written, does rewrites constantly. The mm-hmm. collaboration, even if it isn't, isn't a sitting in their office talking about it, there's a collaboration between if I write it this way, it'll work better for Metcalf than it would have for Chris Guest or somebody like that. Whoever, I don't know who Chris Guest, can right. you imagine Chris Guest is the master? <laughs> no. I can't even imagine Chris Guest. <laughs> <laughs> he has trouble imagining you too from what I bet I'm he saying. does. <laughs> Chris who? <laughs> I got nothing. Uh total blank. Well, I, I, I imagine with that kind of form of TV, like your your performance in one episode would inform the ne- how the next episode's written and, you yeah. know, then how you do that it, it's, you know, that's the co- collaborative nature of the TV show. Yeah. I think that's that's one of the things that can really set apart a serial TV show from, you know, a long, a, a movie or even yeah, the way they do not. shows nowadays for like Netflix, where they, they, they basically, they, they film them as if they're just a very long movie. Right. Whereas it's eight, with it's eight, eight episodes, eight, and it's an eight hour movie, which, which is great for, I think, actors and directors, because you have a much longer time to develop a depth of character and writers work with you to do mm-hmm. that. But uh, in the old days, before they did that in serial TV, the people you wanted to take out to, for drinks and make your friends were the writers because you could then get them right. to take your character or at least enrich it rather than have it always be the same one note all the way through from beginning of the season to the end. Mm-hmm. You want An actor wants the character to grow because that way he can grow too. Wants there to be yeah. some off. financially, oh, not- <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> financially as well as emotionally, yeah. spiritually. <laughs> yeah, I guess I I never wanted to be in a series. I was in the first three three out of the first five episodes of Hill Street Blues, which was a wonderful series. Early on, you guys are probably too young to have ever seen it, but as Stephen Boschko, David Mill, I know and- of it. I haven't yeah. seen it, but I know yeah. it. It's worth seeing. I mean, a lot of what you see on TV now, they broke ground in Hill Street Booth. But they asked me at the beginning, when they cast me in this character, if I wanted to do a sign a contract and do a, you know, you do five years, sign a five year contract. And I said, no, because I didn't want to do that because I wanted to do different things. I wanted to change as much as I could. So they wrote me into three of the first five episodes. And then when they were about to shoot the third episode, I came to them and said, you know, this is a lot of fun and you guys are doing some very interesting stuff and I'd like to work this some more. So if you want to do us, if you want the character to stick around through this season or through a couple of seasons, I'd be fine with it now. I've changed my mind. And they said, sorry, it's too late. The network, the <laughs> oh, network thinks your character is too much of a monster, is a misogynist and a racist, <laughs> oh. just a hor- horrible bad person. And they uh, they need us to kill you off. So we're going to have you get your throat slit by a hooker who you're trying to get a freebie from. <laughs> the end. Thought you were going to say, so. uh, no, you didn't sign the contract. Sorry. <laughs> Too late. <laughs> get out of here. <laughs> the best, the best story about that, that relates to that. And I did a soap opera called one life to live back in the olden days in New York. I just did whenever they'd call me. And if they wanted to, put my character stick into it. I, if I was available, I'd say yes. If I wasn't, I'd say no. And uh, they told me a story once. There was a guy who was in a contract dispute. He was trying to negotiate a contract, more money, talking about financially, for the next season. And they, they, he, wouldn't, they wouldn't, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't come to terms with the network, with the producers. So they 
sent him down to the basement to wax his skis in the story, and he never came back. Hmm. <laughs> he, went, he went to the basement to wax his skis, and he never <laughs> came up. And sometime later in the season, somebody else who looked different than him came up and said, hi, honey, how are you? <laughs> oh, man. Doesn't but, even get like an off-screen death or anything. Just Yeah, no, nothing like that. He just <laughs> went down to wax his skis. It became a metaphor. i use it on my son often when he doesn't listen to me i say you're gonna have to go down the basement and wax your (laughs) (laughs) um so that actually makes me think of another question um because i was looking over your filmography and your roles on tv and everything and you don't have very many like long-standing roles in tv You know, um, I, didn't, heck, I, think- I didn't. I deliberately didn't want to do that. I, I mean, I when I my first, I think five years in New York, I said I, I didn't even audition for any television or movies. I didn't want to do any screen. I just wanted to do theater. And eventually, uh, somebody asked me, uh, Paul uh, uh, Gurian asked me to do a movie that Jack Shoulder directed, that B Straight was in, and Jessica Harper, a short film from a Catherine Mansfield short story. And I thought there was a literary value in a Catherine Mansfield short story called The Garden Party. And they were going to shoot in Vermont. And it was Jessica Harper and Pete Strait. It was a good cast. And I said yes to that. And that kind of broke my hymen, as it were, on uh, on film. And then I sort of started. But I tried to be really selective in the beginning. I got seriously less selective. I mean, if you looked at the filmography, I did an episode of Renegade, and I did an episode of Silk Stockings, and I did a lot of crap. So, but it <laughs> you did took a, lot a while. Of, a lot of things. I had integrity for a while. <laughs> <laughs> uh, did you ever feel like you were uh, in any way being typecast? Did you ever struggle with that? Yeah, I mean, I I I, I was being typecast because they have a very limited imagination as far as casting sure. shows out there. Uh, but I let myself do it too. I did. Uh, I see. In the eighties, I did the Twisted Sister video. Uh, mm-hmm. What do you want to do with your life? Uh, and, I want to, and we're not going to take it. I did those, which really reiterated the the Niedermeyer character. Yeah. Um, and uh, so I, I let it. Ha- I did a really nice film called Mister North that Danny Houston, John Houston's son, directed. Angelica Houston was in it. A lot of really great Bob Mitchum, Harry Dean Stanton, Barb Betty McCall, a lot of really good people in it. And there was one scene where Anthony Edwards, uh, playing Theophilus North, comes to my door to see my daughter. And I I yell at him and Danny and I got kind of carried away and he wanted me to sort of yell at him the way I yelled at, uh, at, at Stephen First and, and uh, Flounder in Animal House. So. Uh-huh. Kind of, I've, I've always resent the fact that I went too easily down that road and uh, uh, ruined that performance. I think oh. by getting carried away with uh, with uh, with reiterating what I had already done before. Sure, and I'm, I'm not. I'm not. I've, as I said, I said no to Hill Street Blues because I wanted to do a lot of different things. I wanted uh-huh. to change right. it up. Right. So it, well, and it gets very limiting if you're always playing the guy who's mad at people. Right. I mean, I'm so glad you had a real answer to that question because the honestly, the only reason I was asking was based on a really stupid pun. I was going to be really upset with myself if I let it pass by, but I we we can't ignore the fact, <laughs> and it, did the irony ever occur to you that you played um, the maestro in Seinfeld and then you played the master, the master. in Buffy the Vampire Slayer, which, of course, maestro just means the master. master right. um, so My, I'm uh, assuming there was some kind of a collaboration between Larry David and Joss Whedon on that. Joss Whedon. I, I, they, got, <laughs> they, dated, they dated for a while, I'm told. Um, <laughs> so I'm sure it's it canon. Discussed. It's canon. <laughs> he said it. You heard him. You heard it on Beer with Buffy first, guys. It's all about starting rumors, and we're starting one now. <laughs> I'm sure Larry will be calling me. Um, yeah, no, uh, Gail Strickland, who was a friend of mine at the time, said that should be the title 
title of your uh, autobiography, From the Maestro to the Master, or From the Master to the Maestro. <laughs> yes. Love it. And I always think of myself as the master. When, mm -hmm. when uh, this, uh, what's his name? The guy, Leonard Bernstein, he plays Leonard Bernstein. Gladys Cooper, not Gladys Cooper. Gladys Cooper is a wonderful actress. Who's the actor? Cooper, somebody Cooper. Alice? No, Alice Cooper. Yeah, no, he's a singer. The guy yeah. who directed the movie The Maestro. Oh, I didn't know there was a movie The Maestro. Sadly. Oh, you didn't? I didn't. You should out more. I should <laughs> <You're> <laughs> preach to the choir, bud. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. There, there, there was a couple of things that blew up across Twitter because uh, there's a movie called The Maestro about Leonard Bernstein, Bernstein. Okay. And you know, if you remember in Seinfeld, I have a long speech with uh, um, with Elaine about how everybody called Lenny Bernstein. Everybody called Lenny Maestro. If it was right. good enough for Lenny, it should be good enough for me. Shouldn't yeah. It? And um, so it was this But thing not in we, social situations. Come on. All, all the time. <laughs> <laughs> I insist upon it all the time. We don't do it in social situations when our, we're not taking it seriously. Um, the... Uh, but there was a thing that went around Twitter and, and the, some of those other social media things when the maestro opened, when that movie opened, because it got a lot of hullabaloo when it opened. Uh, Bradley Cooper, not not Gladys Cooper, Bradley Cooper. Brad, yeah. Name. Hey, that does sound familiar. I've heard yeah. that name before. <laughs> You've heard that name. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you can now call him up and get him on your show. He'd be, he'll do. He'll I'm on do top it. of it. Hey. Yeah. Any help um, you can give us with that, we're um Tell him I said, tell him have. the maestro said he should do your show. Done. I've got um, this on, on Memorex. So. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's being recorded. I saw that <laughs> notation down there before. Mm. Um, yeah, so what was the question? <laughs> so I don't far, remember. So far removed. <laughs> uh, we're yeah. just bantering at this point. Uh, I can come up with another question. I have a whole list of them. Um, yeah. Know. What was it like working on Angel in the episode Darla and or The Wish a couple years after season one of Buffy was done? Uh, were you surprised to have a chance to reprise the role of the master? I was surprised and I was pleased because I'd left Hollywood. I'd quit acting and moved to Wisconsin and bought a restaurant bar and really had thought I was retired. Uh, but the money was nice and it was a great character. And they asked me to come back and do and do that. Um, and I love Julie Benz. I really liked working with her. She's a, a wonderful actress and a, and a, and a, a nice, a nice woman, a very nice woman. I think my experience of her is anyway. Um, David, what's his name? Borean. Borean. Yep. Borean. Borean. He, I'd met on the set. I wasn't in an episode with him, but he was on the set once because we overlapped on Buffy. Oh. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I'd met him and he was, when he first was, on it and he was a nice guy a nice young man and and uh seemed like an earnest actor and, but by the time uh, he had his own show he uh he was kind of full of himself he kind of thought he was all that so he wasn't oh, that fun to work with well but, but it's hard but it's hard to resist doing that and if they're give if they Telling you you're the sexiest man in Hollywood, and they're giving you all the money, and they're da 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 and da da da, -da. Yeah. and they're blowing smoke up your ass all day long from the time you wake up until the time you're tr trying to go to sleep. It's hard to resist. It's hard to not believe all that. That's what happens. Yeah, yeah. you. Yeah. If they inflate your ego, you're going to have an inflated ego. You're going to have an exactly. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's uh, and, and if you're cynical about it, like I was, and say you're full of shit. Uh, then they stop inflating oh, no. your ego. Suddenly, there's nobody blowing smoke up your ass. Oh, <laughs> sorry. Can I say all that on here? Just that's a, that's a double-edged oh, yeah, sword. Uh, you can swear. Our, more our show is facts. plenty vulgar. Yeah, our show is plenty vulgar. You're, you're not <laughs> meeting your quota. If you could swear a little more, that'd be great. Um, <clears throat> uh, no, our, our, our tagline is five minutes. What? One of one of our taglines is that our show is highly inappropriate. Highly inappropriate. I like that. We're highly yeah. inappropriate. Yes. Um, so we <laughs> already covered fruit punch mouth. On another beer. All right. 
Uh, sorry, I was just kind of talking to myself for a second there. That's what we're doing yeah. here, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I never I never got around to asking originally. We just kind of launched into it. How did you hear about or how did you get involved with uh, um, Buffy the Vampire Slayer in the first place? Did you uh, was it just another audition for you at the time or did you hear about yeah. it? Did somebody ask you to audition? I hadn't heard anything about it. I had seen the movie. Mm -hmm. of Buffy the Vampire Slayer that Josh made that that he wrote that he didn't he didn't like very much he didn't in fact that one of the reasons he said he wanted to do the series is because he hadn't liked what they'd done with the master especially oh yeah I've heard that before yeah and uh uh but it was just an audition I think I went back for two callbacks or three callbacks the casting director told me that she was doing something that casting directors will often do when they can't bring in the right person when the right person doesn't show up and the director or producer doesn't say that's what i want you bra- you begin to sort of bracket it you bring in people that are on either side of what he's trying to describe to try to narrow it down right and she brought me in she told me because she was sure that i wasn't what he wanted and, but it would help her eliminate a certain type of actor well but jokes on her now wouldn't it well, yeah, yeah. Where is she now? I don't know. Probably living in a big house in Beverly Hills. I don't know. With an indoor pool and an indoor gym and yeah. servant. Um, yeah, so, but something about what I did and what I was appealed to Joss. And so I went into the next one and another callback and then the other callback and then. Uh, and at the end, I don't know, did I tell the story already? We've been talking for three days now, and I can't remember all of the <laughs> Exactly three um, days, four hours, and 20 minutes. And is three that seconds. how it is? Yeah. Yep, yep. I watched stuff. <laughs> um, the, uh, when, I, when I got the part, I said to Josh, okay, what's the arc? Because we talked earlier about how actors like to know if there's an arc. and what, Where does this character go? What's his journey mm-hmm, in the right. parlance of, the, of uh, us old hippies? To answer your question, you have not told this story yet, so continue. Okay, okay good. <laughs> um, so I said to Jeff, "So what happens to the master as the as the season goes on? Because they they didn't sign me even to a season contract. They just told me I was going to be in, I think eleven or twelve of the thirteen episodes that they were going to shoot, and uh, and uh, he said it's really great. He said at the end in the last episode, you kill Buffy." And I said, oh, wow, that's cool. Does that mean if it gets picked up, the second season will be called Master the Buffy Slayer? (laughs) (laughs) And he laughed and laughed and and then left the room and didn't tell me that I kill her, but then (laughs) she's resurrected and comes back and turns me into into that glitter dust that those other vampires wear all over themselves. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> Didn't they have to destroy your skeleton at some point? Um, was that I actually guess. your skeleton? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a documentary, the whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> I want to yes and my own joke there, but I can't even take myself seriously right now. <laughs> 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 Thank you for rolling with that. <laughs> have, have another uh, ginger beer. Yeah, I will. Uh, um, well, I'm not done with this one yet, but okay. since you told me so, um, uh, this one's for you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you okay there, Rex? You dying? Yeah, just, you know, asthma. It's not a good show oh. if I don't almost kill him at least once. So there it is. It's officially a good. We episode. almost died. I, we all of us almost died shooting the first two or three episodes. The master's lair, the church buried underneath, was all. Co- they really were down in really realistic, and they had real dust, dirt on Ooh. the floor. Oh you know? man! But we were all. It's all so dry, and it's a contained thing. There's nothing. There's no moisture to settle it, and so we were all breathing this dirt all the time. And Ooh. people started getting sick, so they they realized it wasn't adding anything other than maybe a little uh, Ridley Scott kind of misty uh, right. uh, filter to the lens, sure. uh, and they they could do that with the lighting. 
so they uh, they cut it back. They got rid of all the dirt so we could breathe, mm-hmm. and we didn't have to cough from our elbow like Rex. <laughs> Honestly, real like dirt. A good, grateful cough. Very good. <laughs> real dirt's probably better than fake dirt, though. You know, if there's silicone in it, that's how you get that right. uh, black yeah, lung. Yeah, that's how you get rid of sick. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I did a play in New York. I did a, a, a production of The Tempest at Lincoln Center and mm. was on sand. Santa La Costa did the set and the, the whole set was all sand. It's a gr- wonderful theater in the round. I've done a couple of plays there and uh, and everybody was getting sick and they realized it was because the silicone, because the sand was drying out under the mm-hmm. lights. It was getting in the air. People were breathing it and everybody's getting sick. <laughs> Excuse me. I'm speaking of. Breathing. And uh, so then they started wetting the sand Mm -hmm. and everybody started getting a different kind of sick because they were walking on cold, wet sand all the time. Oh, (laughs) jeez. Because we were in Fairfield all the time. This was all in a production of The Tempest? Oh, The Tempest at Lincoln Center, yeah. Okay. Not upstairs. Um, Yeah, that's funny you bring that up. I was going to ask... What kind of roles have you done on stage? Um, I know you... uh, I'm I'm really fascinated with your range. You, you're you're either calm and scary, or or you're very very angry and scary. Like your vein is popping out of your head. Like the <laughs> uh, the the twisted and sister video. I I honestly wondered how you got through that without having a stroke. That was the most impressive part. Um, also the, the stunts. Uh, <laughs> oh, in uh, the twisted sister videos, you mean? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, no, I didn't have a stroke. I was younger then. I'd probably have a stroke now. No, my nose <laughs> would probably be. Um, or that. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah no, was, you're... People used to, what? Um, no, no, sorry. Well, now you're not talking at all. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm and sorry. We talk at the same time all the time. All the time. <laughs> Dang, we'll I missed it. Same time. We tried to, See, we tried to sync that up. There, we got we we to snap at the same time. Okay, and then I'm we'll get <laughs> Rex, calm us down. Um, yeah, I've so been we'll, trying we'll, for five years to calm that man down. <laughs> it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> That's a big part of our shtick, honestly, is me trying to calm Josh down. <laughs> um but no your range yeah, yeah. uh you're you're always very either calm and scary or um or, or angry and loud and scary but also i don't know something about the timbre of your voice and your cadence you have this uh very kind of musical rhythmic cadence to your voice and i was wondering um like how does that lend itself to your th- uh, your stage acting? Have you done any like um, formal vocal training? I can't figure out if you have kind of an accent because you aren't you a Michigan native? Uh, Missouri native. Okay, so I've got I've got a bit of a, a Missouri accent that I worked hard to get rid of, and the college I went to, University of Michigan in Ann Arbor was a very, the, the training, and it was not a conservatory kind of training. Now it's a really great musical theater school. But okay. then it was sort of living off the the reputation of a fellow named Valentine Wint, which was very classical theater. I did a lot of Shakespeare, a lot of Tennessee Williams, Arthur Miller. I did all, and I don't think I did any Chekhov. I did some Chekhov, but all classical theater. And when you come up doing Shakespeare, in those days at that place, they wanted you to speak what we call mid-Atlantic, you know, with mid-Atlantic speech, which is doesn't mm-hmm. exist anywhere. It's somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic where you're all wet, but it's <laughs> a combination of English and American. And it's not particularly productive, but it was so well ingrained in me that it took me a long time to, one, break it down, and also to realize that my Missouri accent was a much more marketable commodity, a, a much more natural, it's a much more natural sound to me. And it's a much more marketable sound than, uh, than that mid Atlantic speech. We never got the kind of, the kind of training they get in England. You see all these American superhero movies are acted by English actors who do phenomenal American accents. They can do an Indiana mm-hmm. accent. Yeah, they, they do. Can- uh-huh. <laughs> I said, yeah, they do. Like even the guy that plays Rick Grimes on Walking Dead, he's British. Um, yeah, yeah. 
Lots House. of British, Australians. They're all yeah. They're they're so much better technically trained than most of the American actors I've run into, or I ran into when I was running into actors. And anyway. but um, what was the question? See, <laughs> uh, the theater, theater, live, oh, yeah. live well, stage well, theater. Well, my range. Yeah. So I've I've done. I did. A, I did. A, I think I thought of really fine Romeo. Uh, I did this, the uh, Macduff in the Scottish play. Uh, oh. I've, I've done a lot. And, I, and the Tempest, I've done one twice. Uh, once at Lincoln Center and then once at the McCarter Theater in Princeton. And I've done a lot. I've done a lot of Shakespeare on stage, too, and a lot of some new stuff and uh, some Sam Shepard. Uh, so I've done a lot of a lot of things. And then when I quit, I quit in 2000, right after I'd done Buffy. And I quit and I moved from Los Angeles to Wisconsin and bought a restaurant. My my woman I was married to at the time and my son's mother, uh, she ran, she knew about restaurants, ran restaurants. I spent a lot of time in bars. So I thought I knew about restaurants. I bought, I bought a restaurant. She <laughs> ran it. I worked the front of the house. I was the kissable lips of a restaurant called Libby Montana, which is still there in Mequon, Wisconsin, just north of Milwaukee. Everybody should go. The fish fry is great. If I'm ever out there, Ooh. I'm all yeah, over. Have a good fish fry. And fish fries, they do fish fries in Wisconsin because it's an old German Catholic tradition. And and there's some of them are good and some of them are just, you may as well stay home and have fish sticks. But uh, <laughs> but our fish fry was really good. But uh, And I quit and I didn't think I'd act anymore. I'd really gotten bored with the parts I was getting, even though I had just come off of doing The Master and come off of doing uh the maestro and seinfeld it was still doing movies and television two things are different once one is that there's not a lot of layers to characters or to scripts to the stories there's not a lot of depth to it not the richness that you get in a play plus doing a play you spend four three weeks four weeks five weeks in a room with a bunch of people figuring out how to do it and finding out about each other, finding out how you work. And you, it, it, the collaboration is much more, there's a, there's a process that I understand and really like in the collaboration. It's and a lot was, more personal, know, right? It's a lot more personal. Yeah. You can bring more of yourself to it and you can also find out more if you're doing a play by somebody like Chekhov or Edward Albee or or uh, even like Edward Lee, Edgar Lee Masters who wrote Spoon River Anthology, things like that, or Kaufman and Hart. I just watched, the other night I watched most of You Can't Take It With You. Great play that I did. It was the first play I ever got paid as a fully professional actor to do. And uh, I'd forgotten what a great, how much it's, Kaufman and Hart are great writers. They wrote some movies, but mostly they wrote plays. Anyway, you get to spend all this time with these people, getting to know them, them getting to know you, sharing, figuring out how to tell a story the best possible way. So I quit in 2000 and bought this restaurant and thought I was not going to do it anymore. And then this fellow came up to me at my restaurant at lunchtime and said, I'd like you to do this play at my theater it's called First Stage Children's Theater. The fellow's name was Rob Goodman. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, I don't want to do children's theater, ghosts and goblins and all that stuff. And he said, no, this is different. This is different. We do it differently. Just read this play. It was a play called Einstein, Hero of the Mind. And it was my character, who was a kind of a magical character that exploded out of a book. And I got to sing and I got to dance myself and a 14 year old girl who was acting the part of a girl who in high school i guess who had to write a paper about einstein and five actors doing manipulating and speaking for uh i think 47 puppets or something like that it was myself this 14 year old girl and 47 puppets told the story of einstein from the time he was a 16 inch marionette puppet and couldn't talk because he was so nervous and he stammered and people thought he was dumb to when he's sitting in a rowboat at the last image of the play after the bomb on Hiroshima, which he was not part of the manufacturer of, but his science was 
the reason they were able to do it. And he had been instrumental in convincing Roosevelt to, uh, to uh, explore this because he knew the Germans were going to be, be trying to create a nuclear weapon. So he sat in a rowboat every day for two years after the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, trying to figure out what his culpability was in this death of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of innocent people. Um, and it, so it was this wonderful play that had this whole historical thing in it, and it was, and it didn't spare anything. It took us through the the Holocaust when he fled Germany and piles trains filled with with dead bodies and. And so it wasn't Ghosts and Goblins. And I got back into the theater and I, I did, I don't, I think I did six or eight plays for them in the time that I lived there. And uh, everything from Einstein, Hero of the Mind, to a play called Midnight Cry about an escaped slave and the Underground Railroad escaping into Wisconsin and then into Canada. Uh, a lot of plays, good The Giver, the Lois Lowry book. For children, and it, you know, for children as audience, and children and their parents would come. We did the Christmas story, and now I'm really off and running. It's but you asked about <laughs> the theater. I so much prefer the theater because it's live. It, uh, as a friend of mine used to say, the difference between acting in movies and acting in a theater is in the theater you can be shot, and, uh, <laughs> and it's really true. I mean, you, you're you're in danger. In a kind of a danger that uh, that you don't get every day, because if you piss them off, and they have shot actors, you know, they've shot people in the theater with Lincoln, but they've also of course. had riots. They used to have riots in New York about the interpretation of Hamlet. They would have people would wow. start. That's how, that's how impassionate people were about the theater. But when you engage people, and you can smell them, and they can smell you, and you're right there, and they can feel that you're spit on them. You're liable to get them passionate, more passionate than than they get about Iron Man. Although my son's pretty passionate about Iron Man. <laughs> Rex is pretty passionate <laughs> about Iron Man himself. Well, I, I can understand. <laughs> He's a pretty funny guy. <laughs> <laughs> funny looking. Oh, sorry. He uh, he got a dig <laughs> on me earlier. I had now to. You're in trouble. I had to pay it back. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, so did you ever get back into film acting? Sorry, I don't recall off the top of my head what your most recent stuff is. Mm, it's hard. There's not very much recently. Um, I did when I was in Wisconsin uh, there. I worked for uh, uh, the Wisconsin Milwaukee Film, which is the, the group of people that put on the Milwaukee Film Festival. And I created a project there called Collaborative Cinema, where we would teach high school students how to write movies and then we would produce we get them you know 50 of them to write a screenplay for a short film and we would produce the best one and uh, oh, it was a great cool. program and because of that i brought in a lot of local filmmakers who were doing mostly um documentaries and uh, uh ads commercials industrial films and stuff like not working on a lot of narrative film and I encouraged them to work on narrative films so because they would teach and direct these short films and and with it with high school students. And uh and there was a fellow named Tate Bunker that I really liked that I've now done one. I guess I've done two, maybe three, two films with him out of Wisconsin. And I have a couple of other people I did short. So I did do some I did get back into doing it, film acting, but not much. I've decided in 2000, I decided if somebody asked me, and they asked me nicely, and they seemed to be like they might be interesting to work with, then I would do it. But it's it's just too hard. It's too hard. The work is is too difficult to waste it on. I mean, I'd rather walk my dog. So that's wholesome. I get that. <laughs> but, if you, but if you've got if you got a job, I'm happy to look at it, and uh, we yeah. could. Uh, I okay, that, that, what? that brings a, a that brings another very important question. What kind of dog? Uh, <laughs> chocolate lab. Three years and uh, oh, I love labs. Four months. Chocolate lab. The English style with a big blocky head and deep chest, and his name's Mike. And nice. He's going to be home. He goes to camp on Friday mornings and comes home at around one thirty. 
so he'll be home shortly. Oh, nice. Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Who's Great walking fun. him now if he's not there? <laughs> he's at camp. He's at camp with Ben. ben oh, okay. He's got a bunch of buddies. So he goes, Basil is there at camp with him, who's a big old white, uh, like a golden retriever, but one of the white ones. And uh, Charlie, who is uh, um, a, a young golden retriever, is one of his pals in the neighborhood. Just Ben comes over from Clackamas and uh, picks up, up pick, he takes about six or seven dogs. And he'll take them down to the river for a swim and play with them for four hours. He just takes care of Mike oh, Love. Cool. Hangs out with these dogs. Wonderful. He comes yeah. home and plays with me for about 20 minutes, and then he collapses and sleeps. <laughs> Heck, it sounds like your dog has a better social life than I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely too. does. My dog is my social life. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, I've been cat sitting recently, and that's that's fun, getting to know some other cats. So that's my social life. Um, <laughs> you guys sound really excited. Uh <laughs> We are. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> are you uh, are you are you working on anything right now at the moment? Any sh uh, plays or whatever? No plays. It's I mean there's just been this bug going around for the last three years. Uh, I can't remember what they call. Yeah, it. haven't heard of it. <laughs> Something with a C. COVID. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I had it. I had it just a, a handful of weeks ago. Oh really? And it, it yeah, it leveled me for did, did a get, solid you week. New, you got the new variant. You got, did you yeah. get rid of it? Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, he was... I'm, I'm good now, but it, it definitely made my asthma worse. Yeah, he was asymptomatic. Well, if you got the pre-existing condition like asthma, that it's going to be bad for you. Yeah, he was... Well, he was asymptomatic when he got it the first time. He was the first person I knew to get COVID back in 2000. And, yeah. Uh, yeah, but this I, time I was it a, floored him. I was an essential worker when, when the initial pandemic hit. I, w I worked in senior housing. So... Oh, wow. So I was, I was essentially front line. You were front it line. Was, yeah. It was, it was intense. It was intense yeah, and terrifying. No, I, I applaud all the people who work front line business. And my ex-wife who ran the restaurant managed to keep it running and open through three years of COVID. I mean, there oh, was wow. a, people needed to get out when they finally could. And she managed to keep the restaurant open. And every, anybody who worked those jobs, we all need to be applauded. I think what, we yeah. it, it'll be a decade before we really understand how the culture was affected by those three years of uh, oh yeah definitely I agree yeah mm -hmm. yeah that was impressive um for for any business that managed to stay open through the uh through the lockdowns i yeah. i was working at a restaurant that had just opened and i thought for sure they were going to go under but they're still clipping along so i guess they had a good enough business model even though i had um, other thoughts at the time, but whatever. Yeah. Good for them. Good for them. <laughs> um, I wanted to ask, what's what's your favorite film project or stage? Um, well, let's let's say film and stage. What's your favorite that, that you've I've ever worked, worked on? on? Um, yeah, uh, it's it's that's all real hard to question. It's like who's your favorite child? Um, <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. I mean, a Animal House was an incredible amount of fun to work on, and it's 45 years old, and people still talk about it and still want to and, and, you know, find out things about it. And I've, in the time, in those 45 years, I've be because it, it's been in a kind of an iconic film. It's an AFI 100 and all that, all those lists it's on. Mm -hmm. uh, I've become better and, and different kind of friends with many of the actors in it you become friends with the people that you're working on the movie with. You become, uh, there's an intimacy, a kind of an emotional intimacy. And then when the film's over, you go your separate ways and you go to find the new, mm -hmm. the next family to work with. But those people have been my family for 45 years for different, you know, different events. And so that was a lot of fun to work on. Uh, but the theater has given me more, as I said earlier, deeper, richer rewards emotionally, psychologically, spiritually, and a play called, uh, a Eugene O'Neill play called Long Day's Journey Into Night was probably one of the more profound experiences in the theater that I've done, although I did a Henry Four part one and two at, uh, when Peter Sellers opened the 
he called it Ant, the American National Theater at, at uh, the Eisenhower Theater in Washington, D.C., with a great cast, you know, a great bunch of people. And that was a really, that was really like a war experience. We rehearsed for seven, seven weeks, and most of that time without a fall staff, because the director, Tim Mayer, couldn't find anybody to play fall staff. Oh, that's terrifying. And they hired somebody. And he quit after a week because it was too intense and too crazy. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was in a production of Macbeth where we had to replace Lady Macbeth, I think, um, with like three or four days notice. And uh, so one of the uh, uh, one of the producers took over. She'd played the role before and pulled it out of her ass solidly. I was impressed. Uh, it's amazing <laughs> what people can do. You, 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 you beg for more and more rehearsal, but sometimes... When you're just doing it on fear, it's uh, great. The guy who finally ended up playing Falstaff, <clears throat> Tim Mayer, the director, one of the smartest people I've ever worked with, uh, talked the guy who was playing Henry the Fourth, Prince Hal's father, Jack McMartin. Uh, he convinced him that when Shakespeare did the play, they did it with twelve actors and everybody doubled, and the classic double during that time was. Henry IV played, also played Falstaff. So Hal's real father, Henry IV, was also the same actor that was playing Falstaff, his surrogate father, his, hmm. his bad, drunken father. And it, it, it made a lot of sense on paper. It was completely made up, but he managed to convince McMartin to do it. Is that his name, McMartin? Martin McMartin, I can't remember. And, uh, and he was great. He was great. His Henry IV had been brilliant because Henry IV is very hard to make him step off the stage and, and into people's lives because it's a very he's a very tight, erudite. Uh, it, it's a great show about politics, but it's not real theatrical. The fun part of Henry IV, part one, is Hal and Falstaff at the bar, drunk, robbing people. And uh, but he could do that, and he had to do. There was one moment in the whole course of the two plays we did back to back. I strung them, sort of wrote them together, where Falstaff and Henry IV are on stage at the same time, and he, Mick, Jack had a uh, uh, a fat suit to play Falstaff, and he just put the fat suit on somebody else who ran across the stage in the middle of a battle, and it <laughs> was that was that was a great that was a great time in the theater, just. Shakespeare. So, and other, I mean, I produced a movie called Chilly Scenes of Winter that four people have seen, but one, one <laughs> critic called it, it put it on its 10 best list of the 70s. Uh, John Hurd and Mary Beth Hurt, uh, Gloria Graham, myself, I'm in it, Peter Riegert's in it. Uh, really good cast. Joan Micklin Silver directed it uh, from a book by Ann Beattie. And that was a, you know, that took two years out of my life to produce it, set it up, worked out. My partners were Griffin Dunn and Amy Robinson, who were just my best friends at the time. And we just thought, hey, let's make a movie. Your dad has a barn. My mom can make the costumes. Let's make a movie. There you go. And we na naively thought that and we ended up doing it. And it's a, it's a good film. It's flawed, but it's a, it's a good film. And that was, you know, that was a, a great experience, too. Criterion Network just picked it up and put it on their list, which is oh, really cool. nice. Yeah. yeah, it's really easy to get attached to those projects that you conceive from the get-go, and you really have yeah. to be the one who makes it happen, you know? Yeah. yeah You're I not get just that. going up and hitting your marks and saying your lines and not and not bumping into the furniture, furniture which I think is something Robert Duvall said, is that's what all acting is, is say your line, hit your marks, say your lines, and don't bump into the furniture. Don't bump into the furniture. That's important. Oh, yes. One time <laughs> uh, in a production of Babes uh, Babes in Arms, I specifically had to bump into the furniture because it wasn't on its spike mark. So, Oh, it was in the wrong place. There's an exception to every rule. Just saying, Mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's true. I think that's the third time you've said that. <laughs> Is it? I... I lost track. So <laughs> I'm glad somebody's keeping track. That's why we pay you the big bucks. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah. I think they're knocking at the door with the trunk full of money right now. 
Uh, they should be. <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm glad that they run, run. <laughs> um, no, I wasn't sure I was going to bring up uh, this movie, but since you mentioned Animal House at the beginning of that, yeah. um, uh, the question about uh, your favorite thing to work on, um, I really enjoyed the movie uh, Futile and Stupid Gesture, and oh, yeah. um, and <laughs> half of the, a, a good chunk of that, a third of that movie is about the production of animal house yeah. Yeah. and the creation of national lampoons and SNL. Um, and right. I thought it was great that they put both you and Harry Groner in that movie yeah. <laughs> um, because you were around and involved with those projects or you were anyway, I'm not sure if Harry was. Um, I don't think Harry was part of it. Okay. Yeah. But obviously you were in animal house. So I was wondering, um, doing a futile and stupid gesture, uh, I don't know, 30 years down the line or 40 or however it w- how many it was. Yeah. A little um, more than 40 years. Yeah. yeah. Um, did you watch that movie and, uh, were you able to say to yourself, Hey, I was there for that. I, um, and that's exactly how it went down or, Hey, that's not how that went down. Like, did, did it give you any kind of a nostalgic moment, um, where it was kind of like looking into a redundant mirror kind of a situation? I, yes. Great. <laughs> Glad we covered that. <laughs> Glad I asked. It was <laughs> such a long question. I thought I'd just give you a short answer. Good. Good. Um, no, it was, it, it was, uh, the book I thought was really good. I thought they didn't quite accomplish what they should have been wanting to accomplish with the movie. And I, I think they might agree that they didn't accomplish it. But it was interesting. I was familiar with the movie. It wasn't like the first time I'd revisited the movie because there had been, I think, at the 40th anniversary of the movie, there were a lot of reunions where we all got together and there had been other things where people have done small reunions. Also, I auction myself off occasionally to show them for to raise money for Alzheimer's Association and a, a, a not for profit that I work with in Montana. I lived in Montana called Montana Natural History Center. Hmm. I'll auction myself off to come to your house, show the movie, tell stories, answer questions. We'll supply oh, wow. some, some appetizers or some food. And people have toga parties and they have a great people have a great time. So I've seen the movie and I've told stories about it a lot. So it wasn't new. They got most of it right. There were some things I guess I didn't quite know, but I'd read the book, the now the uh, uh, biography of Doug Kenny, and I really liked and admired, loved possibly and admired Doug Kenny, the fellow who wrote it, who. who took the Harvard Lampoon with Harry uh, Henry Bean and I think Henry Bean and the two guys that that movie is about and turned it into the National Lampoon and then turned it into Animal House. And um, so I knew I knew Doug pretty well because he was around when they shot the movie. He plays the character Stork and he and I spent a lot of time together because he, he used to tell me that uh, the character Niedermeyer was based on his older brother who was kind of the the golden boy in the family, and Doug was the uh, the goofball. Hmm. There was a kind of thing there. But, um, yeah, so, and th- the funny thing about the movie was that, that, that I was not only, I was on the call sheet as an actor playing some publisher that they come to to try to get uh, uh, the National Lampoon published when they're first trying to get it published. But I was also on the call sheet there was a character named Mark Metcalf, the actor who played Douglas C. Niedermeyer in the movie. So there was a kind of a uh, that mirror thing that you talk about. Yeah, uh, happened when I'd look at the call sheet because I'd go down the call sheet and there would be my name, Mark Metcalf, playing da 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 da, and then there would be some other actor whose name I can't remember playing Mark Metcalf. Uh huh. Is there, who is there for, and at, at the same time playing Douglas C. Niedermeyer. So very confusing, and obviously <laughs> I'm still confused. Yeah. Well, I loved that part of the movie where um, they had um, all those different actors in there playing um, older actors. Like, I think even uh, Seth Not Green was in there playing somebody, and uh, somebody was playing Bill Murray. I can't remember any of these 
modern actors' names, but it was great to see them portraying these classical these these yeah. actors that I grew up with watching in a bunch of different movies and seeing how well they get their mannerisms. That was really fun for me. But uh, yeah. yeah, were were you happy with how that film turned out? I thought it was hilarious. Yeah, well, that that's good. And and having spent this last hour with you, I can see that you might. But <laughs> ah, it's okay. <laughs> um, no, I I didn't. I wasn't happy with it. I I as I said, I really. I really liked, really loved Doug Kenny and thought he was a, a, a had a great, wonderful comic mind, or just a wonderful mind. Mm-hmm. And I don't believe that the film honored and respected him as as well as it could have, should have. I mean, I didn't need to get sappy and maudlin about him, but uh, a pretty interesting guy. More complicated, more interesting than he was in the. I can't remember the actor who played him in that movie. And I could say anything I want because I'm never going to work again anyway. So oh. <laughs> he probably runs Hollywood now. Well, I don't know. Um, so anyway, but I'm glad you liked it. I'm glad you liked it. Thank you. You above I- all. <laughs> <laughs> Special dispensation. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. All right. Thank you. Um, well, I'm I'm pretty much out of questions, and I think we're we're stretching your time pretty yeah. thin. Uh, Rex, did you have any um, yeah. anything to follow up with here? Mike's gonna um, be home. Yeah, not really. Uh, I think we covered everything I I could think to cover, um, unless we wanted to uh, bring up the Prisma Carpenter thing, Josh. I, yeah, there were those extra questions from the email. Let me just run them past you real quick. So, uh, did you have any? Uh, <laughs> Um, comments or anything, any insights about uh, Charisma Carpenter's open letter on Twitter about uh, Joss Whedon on February 10th, 2021, or even just some kind words to support uh, Charisma Carpenter and women and actors in general with their struggles these days. Uh, I'm not aware of, of what Charisma Carpenter said in her open letter. Uh, I am aware to one degree or another of the accusations or the, the things that have been said about Joss Right, Whedon's behavior. Uh, I never saw any of it. Never felt any of it. He has an ego. You have to have an ego in if to succeed in that business, which is one of the reasons I quit because uh, I have no ego. Um, but yeah, I, I, as far as as far as what she petitioned about, as far as the Me Too movement, as far as everything that's happening and has happened and is continuing continuing hopefully to happen in the film business and in other businesses i think it's great and it's about fucking time uh the, yeah the business Fuck is, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> love it the business is is a, is emotion has been the business of it has been uh corrupt for a long long time in many ways, in in the ways, I mean, the, the gender <laughs> inequality and gender, uh, whatever they want to call it, the domination of men, the patriarchy, uh, the patriarchy, or yeah, something, yeah, is, uh, I mean, we've made a mess of it, and uh, it's a, it's, it's about time we. It's only a hundred years ago that women were even given a chance to vote. Right. When they wrote this law, this constitution that everybody praises, women weren't even counted as human beings. African Americans were counted, took three, three African Americans to make one human being, uh, and as far as voting, as far as the, mm-hmm. the way that democracy works. So we have a lot of growing to do. Uh, the backlash, the the maddening backlash about uh, stapling women to their to their womb to their uteruses and, and not letting them have uh, autonomy over their own bodies. Uh, in some states, that's this backlash of of what the growth that happened from Roe v. Wade on and everywhere else is. Uh, is sad, and if everybody doesn't get out and vote in November, it's going to be 
it's the, 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 we we haven't even begun to know what it's like, what it can be like, and um, yeah, things can always get worse. Things can always get worse. Yeah, yeah. Things, things are are bad, and things are better here, here than they are in Gaza. I'd rather be living here than in Gaza, yeah, uh, or or the Ukraine, and uh, both of which are are states that have been, that are being bullied and butchered um mm-hmm. but uh but we can make it better that's kind of the job of being an american is to figure out how to make it better it's a work in progress you're a work in progress you're a work in progress i'm a work mm-hmm. in progress and never say that you... what <laughs> i said i can't deny that and rex talked over me yeah it, it... In the work in progress aspect never stops. Like right, no, it never stops. And nor no. nor should you ever stop doing it. Like no. it, that's that's what living should be. And I think a lot of people kind of forget that part. Yeah, well, it's safer and nicer to think that uh, we're done. I'm who I am, and that's who I'm going to be tomorrow, and the next mm-hmm. day, and the next day, and and not, and then you begin closing yourself off then. And rather than keeping yourself open and uh, inclusive, rather than exclusive, right. and uh, yeah, it's hard. It's it. It takes a, a certain amount of courage to sort of wake up each day and open your eyes and try to look for what's new and good and kind. And yeah. that made me burp. Excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> well, on on that note, um, it's a good uh, note to come up. <laughs> Yeah, I think that was that was a wonderful. I got my whole stir fry right back up in my throat. <laughs> no, People talk so... about having heart, yeah, my heart in my throat because it's so sad, but it's my stir fry. It's it was <laughs> it was a wonderful message, regardless. And I, you know what? Now I want stir fry. So you really can't <laughs> ask for more. <laughs> Thanks a lot. This has been fun. It's been a fun uh, hour and four days whatever it's yeah been. <laughs> it, it's been very fun for me as well i won't speak for rex i'll let him speak for himself no, it, it's been an absolute it's pleasure time. mark <laughs> absolute pleasure thank, you. thank, thank you, you so much for your time and this has been beer with buffy i'm rex i'm josh and this I'm was mark, mark metcalf <laughs> yes and thank you all very much Bye. 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 <laughs> Take care. Do I leave? I'm going to leave now, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Or I can stop recording and we can uh, chat Just for a little talk. longer. Well, if, I've, if, got, I've got to get ready. Mike comes home in a few and I have to do my hair. All right. I'll, I'll let you go and then. I'm hungry. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. And you're hungry. You need to go do some stuff. Yeah. Have, have a good day. <laughs> have a good time. Send Take me, care. Uh, this, you edit this and then you put it on somewhere, right? Yep. yep, I'll put it on YouTube, and it'll also be available in audio form only on all your favorite podcast platforms. Yeah, and we'll we'll send you a link. Send me a link. Yeah, thanks. yeah, thank you. We'll do. Thanks. Thanks. thanks again so much for being here. Yeah, thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye. done why are we watching this <laughs>